So diving back into things today, uh, as I mentioned last time, I want to cover basic wave shapes with you guys. I want to cover um, pseudo random number generators with you guys, and I want to cover reading flow charts because you're going to be doing reading and you need to know how to interpret a flow chart and turn it into a max patch, even though it's there's similarities and there's differences basically and you need to know how to interpret these things because they're going to show up in uh, whatever source you you end up looking at for your research so those are the three main things that I want to uh, check in with you today so tutorial wise though uh, just to check in as far as things you're supposed to be working on uh, you should be approaching about 20 of these done uh, the goal is to have them done in about two weeks from now um, with about 20 on the Mac side 20 on the MSP side um, and as you start to explore the tutorials, you'll notice that several of them have topics related to your, um, your research topics for this uh, project, okay? Um, just a word of that. I don't have a problem with you using them as templates and starting at those points, but you're, you're, can we all agree that your instruments that you're designing should go beyond and should enhance what's in the tutorials, not simply be a copy and paste job, okay? Um, I'm looking for you to kind of uh, research and implement these and kind of uh, show me that you can do more than simply copy and paste things from the tutorials, okay? Um, that Then the other things that you need to be doing in terms of your research projects, uh, your annotated bibliography is due on Thursday. I'll say another word about that in a minute, okay? And then your presentations will be the following Thursday. Uh, with three groups, I'm expecting that each group will probably spend 15 to 20 minutes on their presentation, okay? Uh, that should, in a 75 minute class, we should have plenty of time for every group to do 20 minutes and still have transition in between, okay? Uh, 20 minutes would be the max, okay? 15 minutes would probably be the minimum, okay? So you should shoot for that range, okay? How are you gonna know if you're in that range? Uh, well, practice, right? Okay, you need to practice your presentations and be ready for uh, talking in front of the class, okay? Um, so everybody knows their topics, right? Hopefully you're starting to do some uh, research uh, on these and coming up with sources. Uh, after class on Thursday, as I tweeted out, I did put uh, several things on reserve. Uh, those first few, or I showed you the bibliography last time, those first few texts, I actually put them on reserve. Um, so everybody know how to get reserve titles in the library? No, okay. Go to the front desk, the circulation desk, and say, I need a book that's on reserve. The title is this. It's for Dr. Wallach's for DIGA 461 class. They have them organized. They should have them organized by class, and they should know uh, which ones are on reserve. Uh, so these, and actually, the, the Curtis Rhodes got cut off. It's the biggest one, but it's just below uh, this. And because it's uh, the aspect ratio, I, I had to cut it off, basically. But uh, these five books are on reserve. You'll notice your textbook is on reserve as well. So if, you, if you're someone that hasn't bought the book, uh, there's no excuse not to do the readings because it's on reserve in the library, okay? Um, I was going to put them on 24-hour reserve. The librarian advised me that 24-hour reserve is as good as not putting on them on reserve because they can actually leave the library at that point, uh, which I kind of understand. So I, I told them, at her advice, I went ahead and put them on two-hour reserve, which basically means you have to, you can't leave the library with them. Uh, so you want to go there, do some reading, then hand the back in, take notes, and then come to your computer and Max. Uh, if you have a laptop, certainly you can bring it into the library and be trying things out. Um, but it's a good idea to, to get in there and, and uh, uh, I don't know, take a look at these. And each one of these is going to have a section on your topics, uh, your topic uh, assignment, basically. Okay. Um, let's see. I mean, same rules apply that as with other things. Start with the table of contents and the index, and you should be able to find where it's covered in these books, okay? Um, in terms of your annotated bibliography, how these feed into things, okay? Uh, I'm looking for you, again, annotated bibliography, one per group, okay? So however you want to divide this up amongst your group members, if you want to each take a different source and write up a paragraph on it, that's completely fair game. If one person wants to be in charge of the research, the other one wants to be in charge of actually uh, working on the instrument implementation, that's fine too. It's, it's a group effort, so I'm looking for one per group, okay? Uh, my minimums that I want uh, from this annotated bibliography, you need to use at least one reserve title other than your textbook, okay? So of those books that I just showed you, uh, 
uh, in a stack, okay. Um, one non-reserved title. Uh, where's the physical modeling group? There, okay. Uh, there's a whole book on, I think uh, Perry Cook has a book that it, it's probably two-thirds on physical modeling and physical modeling techniques. Everything from strings to pipes to whatever, okay, so that would be a good non-reserved title for you. It's on that bibliography, um, and you should be able to find it um, in addition, the, uh, additionally through the, 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 the catalog, basically. Uh, and then one web source, okay. Uh, my reason for this distribution is that it gets you at these different types of sources, okay. Uh, that's not to say that you can't go beyond one web source, you can't go beyond one non-reserved title, one reserved title basically. I just want you to be checking these three different places for uh, research, okay? Uh, and basically I'm not expecting you to obviously read the entire book, right? I'm expecting you to read the section that's relevant to your research topic and take some notes, write a brief paragraph on what you found useful from that, okay? Uh, what it is that you are going to be using going forward that helped you understand frequency modulation, helped you understand string synthesis, helped you understand additive synthesis, okay? Make sense? Um, and sometimes it might be historical, sometimes it might be technical. Maybe uh, one source actually points out uh, one of the researchers that was involved in developing the process that the other book leaves off, basically, okay? Um, but I am expecting you to kind of check each one of these types of sources and get me an annotated bibliography for, for Thursday, okay? Um, make sense? I, let me think. How, how, I, how to collect this? I, I'm of mixed mind whether to do it electronically or whether to do it paper version, basically. I realized, uh, I realized we're a digital arts course and we like to do things uh, digitally, but it also would be good in class when I'm meeting with you guys. Uh, I'll, I'll also say my plan for Thursday and my plan for Tuesday is to spend the bulk of time meeting with individual groups and talking through where you're at and how to get the project moving forward, okay? Um, it'd be good to, well, let's see. So long as you either, you can either email it to me or have a paper copy in class uh, on Thursday. Uh, but it needs to be in some sort of format where I can reference it while we're having our discussions, okay? Fair enough? So if you email it to me uh, in advance just so I can get it on my laptop, I can, I can have it to be looking at what you guys collected, okay? Um, let's see. This format, so this format for the annotated bibliography won't change from project to project, okay? Again, it's a matter of an iterative process, at least checking your sources and, and finding details, uh, doing research related to computer music, okay? Um, any questions about what to do for Thursday? No? Okay. And again, one per group. However you want to break up the workload is for you to decide amongst your group members, okay? So make sure you're uh, ta tackling that. Let's see. Okay, I'm diving right into topic at this point. <clears throat> Any other questions about the project? I will say I, I'm, I am developing, I'm, let's see, I'm refreshing the rubric for this project. I, I think I posted the rubric from the last time, which was like a 2011 rubric for grading this project. I'm kind of revisiting that. I'm using some of the same terminology, but I'm changing the way I'm formatting it uh, and how the grading works with re regards to the rubric. Uh, I didn't get a chance to fully complete that today. I should be able to finish that up before class Thursday, but I do want to get you that rubric before, in advance of the presentation because it will help you uh, with uh, putting your sources together and putting your presentation slides together and how you actually present in class for next Thursday, okay? So I should have that for you on Thursday. Let's talk max. Waveforms and envelopes. What do you know about these? We've talked about... Uh, one type of waveform, but what are some other uh, terms that are out there in terms that you, you did a reading for today uh, from your textbook, but there are other things that you know, hopefully, from uh, just dealing with uh, computer music, electronic music in the past. What do you know about waveforms and envelopes? Um, the different waveforms can generate different kinds of sounds. Like mm -hmm. Salsas tend to sound kind of crunchy and sounds more of a smooth sound. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's types of waveforms and there's the, the what we call timbral results, right? The resulting timbres 
uh, which if you've never, if you, this might be something, if you've only read the word timbre, it's spelled T-I-M-B-R-E, okay? So it looks like timber, and you might want to say timber, but it's actually a French word, so we say timbre, okay, timbre, okay, this is how people typically pronounce it. Um, so different waveform shapes, connection with different timbres. And you've mentioned saw, yeah. sine, triangle, triangle. Square, yes, okay. Those are all different types of uh, waveforms and they'll result in different timbres, okay. What about envelopes? What do you know about envelopes? Yeah, they control the attack, decay, sustain, and release. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's uh, envelope applied to the overall amplitude, right? But we can actually apply uh, envelopes to other, other parameters as well, with the amplitude being how loud the sound is, we can apply an amplitude envelope to it, yes. You apply to an LFO too? Yeah, you can change the LFO over time or the, the modulation, okay. LFO stands for what? Low frequency oscillator. Low frequency oscillator, okay. Um, so we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so good, you got kind of the building blocks of what I want to cover today. I want to connect that stuff with uh, Max if you haven't done that explicitly, okay. Um, so let, first and foremost, let's talk about how you view signals in uh, MSP, okay. There's three different objects I have up here, and I'm going to go ahead and switch over to Max and get it launched so we can be looking at that, okay? So if you haven't launched Max already, let's uh, open it up and Set take a look at it. Just to help you see the screen. What now? Can we turn off the satellite and see the screen? Sure, yeah, because it does seem to be more washed out than it was. Turn the side ones back on for us then. Okay. Yep, yep, okay. So here's my patch, okay, we know the cycle object, so let's start there, okay. So go ahead and open up a patch, create a cycle object, and I'm going to go ahead and zoom in on mine. And those are, if you're not familiar with uh, the command plus and command minus actually helps you, you can zoom in on your patch. Um, I do it because I'm up here presenting and I need everybody to see it, but if you're uh, someone who's nearsighted who needs your patch to be bigger, that's one way you can make it bigger, just... Uh, momentarily, and then you can kind of use the minus sign to get uh, make it smaller again, okay? Um, and of the objects that I wanted to highlight today, they're actually found uh, in the Explorer down here under audio. So I've got, I'm actually in what? All and then audio. There's a couple different objects in this area down here that I want to highlight. Uh, first is the scope object. So if you go ahead and click that and drag it in and connect it to your cycle object, okay. Um, and now we need a way to turn audio on and off in order to uh, see what this does because it's not going to do anything by default. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and drag the Easy DAC in just so I have a, a, a handy on-off switch. But I'm I'm not going to connect the sound to it. I'm just going to leave it unconnected and use it as an on-off switch, okay. You need to then lock your patch, and when you do, and then click on the speaker, you should see, oh, obviously not, okay. Why would I want to actually draw this? Let's see, let me check my status here. Core audio. Ah, it might be because I haven't specified a frequency yet. So let's do this. I'm gonna drag in a float number box, maybe. Oh, I have to unlock it first. And connect that to the frequency object. And if I lock it, I type in, I'm going to do a nice low number so I can actually see it. There it is. Everybody able to get this far? Anybody struggling with this? Or you all have this? You're seeing the waveform kind of move up and down. Okay. If I go ahead and lower the frequency here, because that's effectively what this is, and I'll just do this to remind myself. This is hertz. Or I'd say frequency 
in Hertz to be really specific. Okay. Okay, so I'm adding a comment for myself. If I just go ahead and I'm going to lower it down to two, okay, that's going to make it very easy for me to see this sine wave, okay. Uh, if I unlock the patch, I can actually resize this signal scope, okay. So if you get, uh, move down to the lower right hand corner and you want to make this bigger or smaller, this is independent of the zooming function. If you want to make it longer and narrower, you can do that or this way, okay. So whatever shape you need your signal scope to be, you can you can use that. Yeah. The number box. Yeah. Go ahead and lock your patch. The lock that's in the bottom left hand corner, and then you should be able to type in the number box. Dylan, can you make sure? Let's float around. And make sure people are. I've got this. Got it? Okay. Okay. Um, so I went ahead and lowered this to 2 hertz just because then it's uh, easier to see visually. Okay. Uh, because the signal scope is showing me a slice of time and that slice of time is fixed, okay, the lower the frequency, you're basically expanding the wavelength of the, 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 the sine wave, okay? And therefore, it's going to look larger on the screen, okay? As opposed to if I type in, I don't know, 220 here, okay? It's not that I'm, uh, it, the, the, the wavelength is shortened, therefore, it looks more dense, okay? And it's harder to see the shape of this waveform, okay? So for these uh, basic waveforms, in order to be able to see what they look like, it's a good idea to, to operate in very low frequencies, okay? Because then it, it can actually graph it properly, and you can see the shape of this uh, sine wave, okay? So this is a time versus amplitude graph in the signal scope, okay? We're looking at time on the x-axis, and we're looking at amplitude on the y-axis. What do we? What do you know about the amplitude and the way we measure it? Where's Where's zero on the on the y-axis? You guys know this. If you center, yes. Okay. So zero is in the center, right here. And in fact, I can go ahead and it doesn't mark it for you. But if I were to unlock, I'll put a comment here. Okay. Zero. Uh, not smiley face. There we go. Okay, I'm going to put zero in the center. And then what's above zero? One is where? Yeah, at the very top. Okay, so if I option click drag, this is one up here. Okay, this down here then would be negative one. There it is. Okay. Okay, so if you're not clear on, uh, this is a, a important to see basically, that we've got a, a sine wave and you recognize hopefully the, the shape of this sine wave. It's got a nice smooth shape to it basically, to, uh, essentially. But then we also have parts of the wave where it, it goes from zero into the positive region and we have parts of the waveform where it goes below the zero line into the negative region, okay? And the way MSP deals with signals um, audio signals before they go to the sound card should always be in, within this one and negative one range. Okay, it's not that it, they don't work outside of that range, and MSP is happy to deal with audio signals that are outside of the one to negative one range, but it cannot. Let's see, it can't promise you distortion-free synthesis outside of that range. Okay, because once it goes to the sound card, then you're going to start getting distortion. Okay. Uh, this is something real uh, important to point out with uh, people that are new to signal processing, especially in Max MSP, that you need to keep your signal within 1 and negative 1, okay? Because beyond that, you're sending it to the sound card and you're going to get distortion, okay? And there are, let's see, there are ways to get distortion within 1 and negative 1, okay, put it that way, okay, that are more controlled than just sending it a really loud signal to the sound card, okay? Um, okay, so I pointed out the signal scope. Uh, the other one I want to point out is the spec. So was it spectros? 
spectroscope, okay, down here. Go ahead and drag that into your patch, and I might need to actually get a little smaller here to fit it in the range, okay. Go ahead and connect your cycle to the input of the signal scope. And you'll see that it draws it in a completely different fashion. Anybody know what this one is? Spectral, but what? Yeah. Spectral frequency. Spectral, okay. Well, spectral basically just means dealing with frequency. It's an adjective that talks about frequency content, okay? Yeah, it's, it's frequency on the x-axis and amplitude on the y-axis. So what you're seeing, there's a peak down there at 2 hertz. So if you take your cycle object now and, um, I'm going to lock my patch, take your frequency number box and go ahead and just run it up and down, what you'll see is that peak starts moving up. Okay? So right now, this is a peak representing 3,095 hertz. As opposed to when I move it down, you know, now that's 1546, okay? Okay, so as I move this up in frequency, let's see here. If I can, I'm going to increase the width of this. If I go ahead and put 2200, 20,000, yep, that's up there at that range, okay? So you can start to see... I'm up there at the top of my range. I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm always, let me, uh, let's say, you should always be suspect of graphs that don't have labels, okay? So I, that's why I like to stop and kind of point out what the labels should be, what the, axis, what the axes actually represent, and understanding your graph in terms of the range that it represents, okay? That's the point of this exercise here at the beginning. So right now, I'm up at near 22,000, at the, the extreme right end of the graph. Does that number ring a bell for anybody? 22,050? No? Oh, I put it. Well, what's the sampling rate for CD quality audio? Yeah, 44,100, right? Okay. So 44,100 samples per second is what CD quality audio is. It's actually giving you the, the amplitude 44,100 times per second, okay? And if you uh, remember, or hopefully it was covered in your, your 161 class, if not in 161, we'll, I, I can mention it briefly now. Uh, you can, when you have a digital signal, okay, you can only represent uh, frequencies up to half of the sampling rate. So in CD quality audio, 44,100, you can only represent frequencies accurately up to 22,050, 22,050. That's half of the sampling rate at CD quality audio. So that's why this graph goes from 0 to 22,050. Okay. So as I move down, let's see. So I'm, as I move this down, you'll see I go below this, okay, um, and then the question is, what happens to a frequency above that range? Well, if I keep going up, see how it comes back down? So even though I'm at 26,803, I've actually kind of folded back in to the audible range, and if I do, let's, I don't know, I'll do 36,000, okay. Uh, this is maybe where attaching the sound will help, so let me do this real quick. Hey, listen to that. So, let me see what's going on here. I'm increasing the frequency, but what's happening perceptually to the sound? It's going down, right? Okay. Because what's happened is we've gone beyond what the digital system is able to accurately reproduce. Okay, we've aliased this frequency back down into the audible range. And so even though my wireless is cut out, okay, even though I'm at 43,017, this is not actually a 40, what you're hearing is not actually a 43,000 hertz sine wave. You're hearing something 
more akin to blah, 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 a little less than a thousand, basically. Okay, that's not 44,000. Okay, can we all agree on that? And that's actually probably more like, it's probably 88, what it should be. If my math is serving me correctly. Okay, makes sense? So this is uh, aliasing in action. If you learned about aliasing in your 161 class, uh, it's going to come back to bite you here in uh, synthesis because you need to pay attention to what frequencies are being generated and whether they are generating they're the actual frequency you intend or whether they're aliasing back into the audible range and you're getting these ghost frequencies that, sh that are not accurate, okay? Um, let's see here. I think that's all I wanted to... Oh, uh, there is this little uh, level meter, okay, which can be handy as well. Uh, right here, meter tilde. So I'll add that. In. No, come on now. Oh, I have to unlock it. I always forget to unlock Okay. So this is basically just a uh, a reading of signal strength, okay, which can be handy if you're trying to make sure that you've got signal going through at various points. Uh, there is also the ability. Let's see. In addition to dragging a meter object into your patch, you can also come up here. Where is it at? Yeah, under debug probing. If you turn that on, you can actually float over cables and see how much signal is going through that cable, which is a handy tool as well. Okay, Again, that's under debug probing. You want to have a check next to that in order to be able to see how much signal is going through a cable at a given point. It does use a little bit of CPU, but um, you probably shouldn't have any problems. You shouldn't have any problems with that. Uh, here in these very early projects, basically, but and it could be handy to have it on. Okay. Okay. So there's our sine wave. Uh, a couple different ways of looking at it, and a little side note about aliasing. Okay. Uh, I'm on like my fourth slide, and we're a half hour into class. That's I don't know if the hell that. Well, I'm on my seventh slide. Okay. Sorry. It's not quite as dire as I thought. Okay. So waveform shapes. I think we mentioned most of these. Yes. Although the band limited pulse is maybe something we didn't uh, talk about, okay? Uh, we need to find max objects that correspond to these uh, waveform shapes, okay? Um, and the question is how to do that. Well, I can, one, I can tell you, but two, you can also do some uh, searching. Let's see here. So if you're in the max help under MSP tutorials, okay? Uh, there's a couple different ways to do the this. Let's see here. If we scroll down, no. Let me go to the documentation home. Ah, okay. Here's where they put it. So on the documentation home, there's this find the right MSP object. Okay. Uh, there's objects by function, which basically says, well, uh, if I want something that's going to have to do with synthesis, I should be looking at these objects, okay? And you might see that some of them have names that are, uh, I don't know, evoke those wave shapes that I just put up on my slide. Rect, saw, try, okay? Uh, there's also, let's see, the uh, A to Z page. Yeah, this is just the object names by alphabetical. And there used to be what's called a thesaurus. Yeah, the max object thesaurus is a very handy thing as well. So if I do a find rectangle, no, no, I have to actually. Okay, there's that one. That's the only one there. If I do waveforms. Buffer viewer and editor, great. That's not what I want. Distort a sawtooth waveform. Display its content. No. About uh, synthesis. Additive synthesis. Ooh, look at that. So that's that's a key word, right? Okay. Some objects. So the way the thesaurus works is like, okay, if I'm looking for additive synthesis, 
I should be looking at these objects and I can maybe pull up the help patches, which actually is what this does. Well, it pulls up the help page and then you can pull up the help patcher, okay, and see what the thing does, okay? And I'm gonna shut off my Wi-Fi so that warning goes away because that's annoying, okay. So it makes sense. There's like three different ways to find the right MSP object because the name doesn't always correspond to the technique you're trying to achieve. Okay, you've got the thesaurus, and I, the way I got there was documentation home, explore audio, and there's this link that says find the right MSP object, and there's links that are embedded in this page that will help you uh, get to the right objects for what it is you're trying to do. Okay, um, so we speaking of right objects, we want to actually find the, the objects for these different things. Well, we've been dealing with a sine wave, or as I've pointed out repeatedly, a cosine wave, okay? Uh, single harmonic. Well, I've got this word harmonics up here. What, is this, what does that mean? Let me know what I mean by harmonics. Noise? Mm, no. Uh, like, uh, when I think of harmonics, I think of like higher pitches to make it sound like the instrument that it's supposed to be. Ah, okay. Yeah, there's, uh, there's the pitch that you perceive in an acoustic instrument, and then there are what are called harmonics. Okay, and the 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 relative strength of the harmonics has to do with how we perceive timbre, okay? So let me demonstrate what I'm talking about here. Uh, we've got this lovely patch, and I'm going to have to keep making it smaller, okay? I'm going to go ahead and delete this patch cord, but I'm going to keep it in there, and I'm going to create another number box, and I'm intentionally going to use an integer number box, okay? Let me think. How do I want to do this? Uh... Well, I'll, let me build it and then I'll show you the problem. Okay. I'm going to basically uh, not add, I want to multiply, excuse me. I'm going to multiply it by a number so that I can actually multiply two numbers together, okay? And I'm going to start at something like 220, set this to 1. Let me, let me know when you get there, okay, if you're able to build this, okay. Because what I want to demonstrate for you is what harmonics are and how you can work with them. Okay, I'm going to turn mine on just so you can hear it. I can... I can click and drag this, move it up and down, but I can also, now that I'm multiplying by two, and this, this shows a kind of problem with the right to left ordering, right, and the hot versus cold inlets that I mentioned quickly last time, right? What's happening here as I change this four, the sound doesn't change until I actually move this dial. Why is it doing that? Yeah, only the left inlet on a math operation is actually going to trigger the operation, okay? That's a problem because I want to be able to change this number and have the formula update, okay? There's a couple different ways to do that, but the one that I uh, uh, typically do to, let me think. Yeah, the, the one that I typically... Uh, use just because I'm uh, it, maybe it's a little more old school than some other ways that are out there um, I use the trigger object okay and if you're not familiar with this object you can open up the help patch trigger basically allows you to have one input but then update multiple outputs so as I change this it's basically sending the value out to these outlets in order one two three four five and I can, how shall I put it? 
I can actually use this to my advantage to basically send a bang out in, into the math operator every time I update the value on the right hand side. So I'm not using it in this configuration where I've got five outlets. I've actually got two outlets. So in order to make this clearer, I'll go ahead and trigger can be trigger is used so often that it can be abbreviated to T. But just to be explicit for you guys so you can see what's going on, trigger BF. What happens is now I input my value here, okay, my value from my number box. I'm going to then connect the right outlet into my math operator, and I'm going to connect the bang to the left inlet. And what that does is it's first going to take whatever number comes in, and it's going to send it into the math operator here in the right inlet. But then it's going to send a bang to the left inlet, which is basically going to just say, whatever the last value you received, go ahead and do that. Uh, process that again, but now that you've got the new input, it's going to actually run the operation again. So this will cause both number boxes to affect my mathematical operation here. Okay? So turning this back on, let's start with 200. Okay? Better, much better. Okay. So I'm actually that's 200. Okay, harmonics are at integer multiples. So the first harmon the first harmonic is 200. Then the second harmonic would be 400, 600. Ever hear that? Okay, you may have heard that. I don't know. Are there any brass players in here? Anybody ever played a brass instrument? Right. Okay, harmonics. You know, you're doing lip trills and that sort of stuff as warm-ups. Okay, you're actually playing the harmonics of your instrument, basically, is what you're doing. Um, um, so what, what we're, all we're doing is changing the integer that we're multiplying 200 by. Uh, and if we actually wanted to see this update, hey, how about that? We can drop another number box in here so that we can see the actual well, frequency being played. So the first harmonic, second harmonic, third. You hear me stopping on all the doublings? Any, anything that's a, uh, a, 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 not a multiple of two, but the powers of two, okay, is going to sound like an octave. So there's the fundamental, but then that's an octave. Then I go up to two to four. Then I go up to eight. You hear the octaves there? Okay. So those kind of occur naturally in the harmonic series. Okay. Oh, okay. So all this to say. Get us back to our original slide, okay? So, a sine wave is a single harmonic, okay? Then all the other waves are made up of multiple harmonics in relative amplitudes, okay? So we can actually create a triangle wave with odd harmonics, basically all the odd numbers one, three, five, seven, okay? And each increasing one, it will be at one over n squared power. So the, the third harmonic will be one over three squares, so one over nine power. The fifth harmonic will be one over five squared or one over twenty-five power, okay, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. As opposed to a square wave is one over n, so one over two, one over three, one over four, one over five. Same thing with sawtooth and then a band limited pulse. Okay, so objects that you want to look at for these, okay. I'm gonna go ahead and just change this out and put a one here. But just to show you a saw wave, okay? And you notice in the it, it's built into the I, I mentioned aliasing, and there's a reason I did that. Right here, built into the description, anti-aliased sawtooth oscillator, okay? All these harmonics add up, and they actually can exceed the Nyquist frequency. What these anti-aliased oscillators are doing, they're basically making sure that you don't have any harmonics that are beyond the Nyquist frequency, so you don't get any crunchiness 
when they alias back in. Okay, so here's a saw wave. Yep, let me zoom back out. I have to tell it what to play. Okay. What do you notice about the graph over here? The spectrogram. Can you see that? The difference there? I suppose that before when we had a sine wave, we had just one peak. Now we've got all these peaks, and you see they're, they're kind of descending in order. And if I lower the frequency of this to back to two, okay, now we're just going to get a pulse. Sorry, I should. I have to increase it to at least a frequency. There, now I can see them. So I should have gone higher, not lower. Everybody see the peaks? Those are the harmonics in our sound. Okay? So the spectrogram is nice for graphing those harmonics and seeing the relationship between them. Okay? So let's go from saw now to, let's see, I think square wave is actually called rect because a square is like a rectangle, right? And if I show this. We see the visual difference there. So we went from saw, which would have been here, all harmonics, to square, odd harmonics. So when you have all harmonics, you've got one through n. But when you've got odd harmonics, every other one is missing. So everybody see the visual difference between rectangle there and so, uh, okay, that's gonna... Ever see how there's more harmonics there? You're filling in those gaps. Okay, so, saw, well, we need a triangle wave. Let's hear what that sounds like. Oddly enough, it's called try. Turn it on. And... Okay, everybody hear the sonic difference there and then a band limited pulse this is a little bit different let's see we could look at um, a couple different ways to do that uh, is, there, is there a pulse object I'm trying to remember no there's click which is it in, creates an impulse the problem with click is that it actually you can use this to create sounds I think the problem is you have to actually bang rather than use uh, frequency. I'm trying to remember what the one is that... No. I'm blanking on where the band limited pulse is at the moment. But just to... Well, let me do this just so you can hear what this sounds like. Because I can actually put a bang button here. So here's a here's a pulse. Can you hear that? It's a little it's kind of soft. Okay. That's one sample of one surrounded by a bunch of zeros, basically. That's what that pulse that click is doing. Okay. Uh, that one will be important for physical modeling and that sort of stuff. You're gonna you're gonna need a, something to excite the resonators, okay, if you're if you're getting getting into implementation things, okay? Um, there's other ways to do that as well, but click is, is a, a nice, easy way to excite the resonators, okay? And just, let me see here. Okay? Uh, I think I've covered all of those. So I'm looking at my time. Okay. A couple of things to kind of po to point out here to, that you need to know. Uh, I've mentioned kind of going above the line and below the line, okay? Uh, there are some signals that are unipolar. That means they stay on one side of the zero line on the signal scope. So back to my patch here, okay? If a, if a signal stays above the zero line, it's considered a unipolar signal. If it goes above and below the line, it's considered a bipolar signal, okay? Um, that can be important because sometimes the synthesis technique is, is dependent on... Uh, a unipolar versus a bipolar signal. Where's the modulation group? 
over there. Yeah. The differences between ring modulation and amplitude modulation are unipolar versus bipolar. So if you don't pay attention to that, you're actually you're implementing the wrong one. Okay. Um, control signal versus audio signal. This gets into enveloping. Uh, it also gets into low frequency oscillators, LFOs. Okay. The only difference between an LFO and a and a regular oscillator is just how frequently it's modulating. Okay. Um, and it relates to hearing range. So an LFO is going to be below 20 hertz, where we start to hear pitch. Okay, so if you see something calling for an LFO, but you dial it in at 200 hertz, you know you've, you've made a mistake because that's no longer an LFO. That's actually an audible uh, frequency. Okay. Um, okay, we mentioned ADSR, yes? Attack, decay, sustain, release. This should look somewhat familiar to you. You may have seen this on a synthesizer at some point. Okay, um, what it's meant to do is provide you with a. Well, I mean, keep in mind, it's not the only way to generate an envelope. It's just a good um, generic template for generating envelopes. Okay, and and by which I mean you can basically generate whatever kind of envelope you want using an ADSR envelope. Okay. Um, and this is important. You guys were looking at the amplitude mod or no, the additive synthesis patch, right? And you saw the function graph, okay, for generating that. There is also an ADSR tilde object, which will generate these, okay? A um, couple things to keep in mind. It's actually the A, D, and R that are measured in time. The S is measured in amplitude, relative amplitude. Okay, so how high that plateau is. So it's a little bit different unit of measurement. Um, to show you where this is, and I'm sorry if I'm rushing, but I'm, I'm noticing like what I wanted to get through and the fact that I'm 50 minutes into class. So I'm, I've picked up the pace here. Uh, let's see. ADSR tilde. And if I open up the help patch on that. Okay, you see that I can uh, change the attack time to K time. Sustain is in gain, and then release is in milliseconds back again. Okay. And let's see here. Uh, I hope they have one here. No? Maybe one we can start. Yeah, you can see how this is a, they've got a unipolar ADSR envelope down here. They've, uh, they've probably changed the signal scope so that this is now zero, this is one up here at the top. But all we're doing is taking, let's see, where's this? Yeah, they're using this phaser. Which is another way to do a, a, a sawtooth wave. Yeah, sawtooth signal. Okay, so the 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 benefit of the ADSR envelope and is that you can rather than having these sustained tones, you can start to envelope it to create discrete note events. Okay, so that's how you start to segment things in time. Is through the ADSR envelope. Okay. Uh, let me see here. Do I need to demonstrate that here, or more? Or do you guys know what an ADSR envelope is and what it does? Or stop me if I need to take more time on something. <laughs> okay. Let me do this. There was a one here. This is a good one. Under poly, there's a Man, okay. They made it polyphonic. I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal these little dials right here. Connect it to my ADSR. Okay. Okay. So now I've got these connected. 
what we I would do in the case of if I was doing a sawtooth oscillator, okay, and I wanted to envelope the sound. Let me take this out of here. Um, enveloping it is basically applied via multiplication. So if I drop in a multiply object tilde, I can connect my sawtooth wave and I can, let's see, oh I need to actually trigger this, don't I? Signal or float. Hold on here. Let me remember how this works. Start the envelope zero. So zero and one. So if I just put a, a message box here, or I could do a trigger or a toggle switch. Oh, it's not going to take it because I need to put a. Hmm. I guess I need to have a float. Hold on here. No, you're gonna make a liar out of me. Well. Oh, that might be. This is not because I just changed it. Hey, there we go. Okay, thank you. This this wasn't making any noise. Basically, is what it came down to. Uh, sustain time here and my release time. Increase that. Okay. So the way this works now, uh, you can trigger the start of the envelope. That's the release of the envelope. Okay, it's going to stop in the middle. Um, and the nice thing about having two messages, one for the beginning of the envelope, one for the end of the envelope, is uh, how would that connect with your what we learned about MIDI last time? Yeah, note on and note off. You can have the beginning of the envelope be when you press the key and then release the key, and the, it will release the note. Okay? That's why there's like these two parts to the ADSR envelope. Okay. Now that I got that working. Uh, let's see here. Let me let me look at my notes here. Okay. Um I'm trying to think through how long it's going to take me to explain some of these things and whether I'd be better just opening up for questions. Uh, wait. I, I'm trying to interpret your silence, whether you're like lost or whether you're like totally engrossed or what's, so what's the temperature in the room right now? Are you guys, is this making sense to you or like and this is basic stuff that I've already I don't. I shouldn't be wasting time with, or is this helping you in terms of seeing where to go for your projects? I understand so far. I'm just trying to figure out how to connect to MIDI. Now we can do it. Ah, okay. Connecting to MIDI. Okay, so that's connecting from last class to this class, right? Okay. How's, what's What's your sense, Leo? Yeah, I understand. You understand it? Okay. Chris. Yeah, it was just. Right. Right. Okay, have you been able to like watch the videos? Okay, and the videos are there. I mean, the videos are there for people, not just people that are absent, right? The people that uh, if you if you want to recap something from class, by all means, re uh, rewatch the videos. I've tried to create little um, indexes as well, so that the timings. I haven't done the one from la from Thursday, but uh, if you go to the YouTube video in the description, you'll see that there's time markers like where where I hit on specific topics. So. 
instead of watching the whole hour-long class to see where I talked about the cycle object, I've got a little time marker where you can click and go to that that time, basically. Michael, what, what do you say? Uh, I understand. You understand it? Okay. Eric? Kind of? Okay. Robert? You getting there? Okay. I'm just, uh, I, I don't want, I mean, yeah. I'm trying. I know. I realize I'm trying to cover a lot, but I also want to make sure that I'm setting you up with all the information you need that uh, for this project, basically. And as I said, Thursday and to, uh, other, Thursday, I do need to talk about the project rubric and make sure we're all on the same page as far as what the expectation is for the presentation uh, the following Thursday. Um, but the majority of class will be spent kind of meeting with individual uh, groups to look, work through your project and help you kind of get get going on these. Okay. Uh, I'm just trying to give you a sense of, uh, well, one, common topics that you all need to know about, and two, things that you don't, well, I'm also trying to give you everybody a baseline so you're not having to cover this stuff uh, in your presentation. So your presentation shouldn't be about how MIDI protocol works and what the basic waveforms are. It should be truly about how frequency modulation works and this is my implementation of it and we all should know what a sine wave is at that point. Does that make sense? So I'm also trying to cover it from that perspective, okay. Um, I'm feeling like I'm a little scattered. Are you, is it reading a little scattered to you guys or no? Be honest, yes, okay. Monica's saying yes, okay. I'll trust her on that one, okay. Um, I don't know if that's because I've, I feel like I organized these, I don't feel like it's coming across organized and so I apologize in that regard so this is me being reflective about how class organization in that regard okay um, what would help at this point slow down and connect it to the MIDI from last time and just forget about pseudo random number generators and flow charts and that sort of stuff yes okay so get it so that I can play with a keyboard an ADSR envelope with a waveform coming out of it okay so we need keyboards to do that. Let's do that. Everybody, if you don't have an instrument, get an instrument. Or a controller, I can say. I'm going to need one. Make sure each group has one. Do you guys have one or no? One It's an MRL. I think the rest of them are rolling. Oh, you should be cool. Okay. Okay. There you go. Also, I have another question. Yeah. Is it possible to connect your knobs on this to the knobs up here? So I can yeah, they should be control and view. Remember the control in object from oh. last time? Yeah. Okay. So I've got this. I need mine. There we go. Okay, so scrapping this. Pseudo random number generator. Talk about it another time. Okay. Let's see here. Well, let me save this and then I'll start. Okay, let me do, uh, do a new patch. Okay, so what's the object we used last time to get information from our keys on the keyboard? Anybody remember? Note in. Note in, yes. So go ahead and create a note in object. I'm going to go ahead and increase the size of mine, okay. And that's going to give us two pieces of information that we need, okay. We've got, we're probably not interested in the channel in this respect, in this, at this time, okay? But we are interested in the pitch and the velocity, okay? So I've just connected two number boxes here so I can see those pieces of information, okay? Now, if I want to play 
a, let's do a saw wave, okay? So use a saw tilde object, okay? But what the problem here is that MIDI pitch is expressed one way, but if you look at the sawtooth uh, oscillator, it needs frequency. Anybody remember the object for that? MTOF. MTOF, or MIDI to frequency. So if I connect my MIDI note number to my sawtooth wave via MTOF, it's going to do the conversion for me. It's going to take the MIDI note number, convert it to a frequency out, and connect that to the sawtooth wave. Okay, So that I can then, I'll connect my easy DAC for now, just so I can hear this. So now rather than number boxes, I should be able to Lovely, okay? So the problem here is that I've got now a perpetual waveform, right? It's going to keep as soon as I hit a key, it's going to just keep playing indefinitely until I turn it off or turn down the volume or whatnot, okay? So I can turn off my patch real quick. I would like to envelope the amplitude, okay? That's how I create these discrete note events in basic synthesis, okay? So I'm going to delete this cable that I connected to. Ah, come on there. There we go. No. Yeah, and if you, uh, uh, let's see, if you're Struggling with deleting patch cords, okay? There's a couple different ways to do it. One, if you float over the patch cord, there's a little blue arrow that pops up, and that gives you a menu, and you can delete it there. You can also, you'll notice that if you click and drag, it doesn't select patch cords. It only selects objects. But if you press Option, then click and drag, it'll select the patch cords. Okay, so that's two different ways to select a patch cord and delete it. Okay? So I want to multiply it by my amplitude envelope. That's what's going to allow me to apply the envelope. Okay. And before, all I was doing was I was, I, I remember on last Thursday I did something like this, right? And I just applied that here. So that as my note ons came in, let's see. But that's a very coarse control. It's either on or off. Okay. If I would like something a little more subtle, that's where I need the amplitude envelope. Okay. Um, so first up, I need to know whether it is. Uh, actually, no, I, I think it um, that ADSR object, I needed a scale, correct? Let's see. So probably, let's go ahead and divide by 127 again, because if I'm not mistaken, that ADSR envelope needs a value between 1 and 0, right? And dividing by 127, remember our, our velocities come in and values up to 127? If I hit really hard? No. I'm being just a bunch of 63s. Why is that? There's there's 127. Huh. Interesting. There's a whole series of notes here where I can't hit them hard enough to get one. Anyway, okay. The the mechanics of this controller, yes. Um, but anyway, this is going to give me a number between one and zero. So if I connect a flow num here, I'll be able to see those numbers. Okay. That's what ADSR needs in order to work properly. So let's go ahead and create an ADSR object. Okay. And I can then just connect that number box directly to the ADSR for control purposes. Now this isn't, I haven't changed anything in terms of uh, the actual shape of the envelope, but this should allow me to start to apply the envelope. So let me turn this on here. Okay. Are we able to get 
get sound out of their patch doing this. Is everybody getting sound? You guys get a sound over there, Monica and Robert? Or? Yeah. Yes, okay. So now we'd like to start adjusting our envelope, okay? So we can do that either with uh, any number of user interface objects. I can either add more uh, number boxes, uh, which would be, let's see, I'll do this. I'm gonna, I'll, yeah, I'll do that for, for now. But I could easily add sliders or knobs. Those are all available to me in Max and MSP, okay? But I'm gonna just do this just for, ah, why is it not? Okay. Yeah, nice low notes. Okay. So now I've got control over the individual elements. So this is A, D, S, R, and I can, if I really want to make my interface useful, I can do something like this. Uh, interface design is something you need to be concerned with in your patches, making sure that it's usable for you yourself and for others to come behind you and use your instrument, okay? So I've got my ADSR controls here. So now if I increase this, these are the ADS and R, A, A, D and R are measured in milliseconds. So if I type in 10, and play, as opposed to if I type in 1000 and then play, ever hear that sloping effect? Okay. Now the release time as well is in milliseconds, so if I want a nice long release tail, I can put in 2000, and now, it, now with just the A and the R, I start to compose nice uh, I don't know ambient music if I want lovely okay so just by manipulating the A and the R I can get nice smooth long envelopes okay does this make sense how this is working? Okay. Um, what if I wanted to change the timbre of this? What would I change? I can, with one object, how would I change the timbre of this? Yeah, the oscillator right here. Okay. So if I change this to a cycle, I can go back to being a sine wave. Okay. Now, where I was going with um, the randomness, okay, we can have multiples of these. Okay. I don't have to have just. Um, one sine wave, okay? I can actually, uh, 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 let me take the uh, randomness out of the equation. Let me take, let me just apply it in terms of detuning, okay? So right now, I'm going to get a perfectly tuned C every time I play that note, okay? But if I also add a flow num do it this way and I'm gonna create an addition okay I can actually add a little bit of detuning let me try I'm trying to find room in my patch here let me do this everybody f able to follow along with what's going on if I just do that all I did was spread the two parts okay if I instead now put here 
This is frequency, right? If I want to add a little bit to my frequency, I can do that. And I can create a second cycle object here. Okay. I can apply the same envelope. Again, it's not inlets and outlets are not one to one. I can do one to many. Okay. And then I have two different channels up here, right? I can have a left channel and a right channel. If I want to detune the left channel from the right channel, I now can change this number box and affect the de the tuning of the right channel. So let me hit let me play real quick. Okay, we're getting two. Right? They're they're nice and in tune with each other now. But if I simply take this number and I put 0.5. Uh, that's not enough to hear it, so let's increase it a little bit more. Ever hear the pulsing? Okay. All of a sudden now I've got a more rich timbre, right? There's some there's it's more active, there's more going on by having that one detuned oscillator. And it's even more rich because I'm literally, if I, if I pan this, that's in tune with itself. That's in tune with itself. But it's when they're both together, okay, the throbbing actually happens in the air because I'm sending one to each side. We're out of time, but what's your question? <laughs> um, what is the thing that detunes it? What is it measured in? Well, let's see. I'm on this side of the MTOS, so I'm dealing in hertz. I could also work on this side if I wanted to, and I could actually put it into another M2F, and I could actually detune this in terms of fractions of a half step. So that's another way that you can do it as well. So if you want to do like quarter tones and that sort of stuff, you could do that on the other side of the MTOF. Okay. So that's that's what I want. I'm going to have to leave you there. Okay. Because uh, I, I, there's another class waiting, basically. That's the main reason. But uh, I'm happy to answer questions, uh, I don't know, either via email or I'm going to do office hours right now over in Flagler if you've got time. Um, I look forward to your annotations, uh -huh. your bibliographies for Thursday, okay? The reason for having those due in advance is to make sure you're starting the research process now, okay? Yeah? Uh, I just have a real quick question about the patch. The okay. Let me just shut this down and uh, we'll go from there, okay? See you all Thursday.